Um, tonight we've got um, Dr. Tristan Wyatt speaking. He's a senior researcher in the Department of Zoology. Um, he's been a fellow at Keeble College since its foundation, and he has just had a new book out, um, Pheromones and Animal Behaviour, which just last week won the prize, is from the Society of, of Biology for Best Postgraduate Textbook. And he's currently working on a, very short, a version of that, a very short introduction for the AEP. And, um, so Great. Well, thanks very much. Do come towards the front if you wish. Um, but I will shout, whatever. So, um, yes, in fact, I'm a founding fellow, and not many people alive today can say that in Oxford, of a college. So it's actually not Keeble, but Kellogg. Um, so it's the College for Part-Time Graduate Students. Um, we're just up on the Banbury Road but we were started um, 25 years ago um, this coming year. Uh, what I work on is pheromones. Uh, I made a choice of project for my PhD, which turned out to be even more obscure than I realized when I started. And it was on parental care in subsocial uh, beetles uh, in a tidal zone in North Norfolk. And this led to very limited career opportunities. <laughs> However, pheromones, it turns out, uh, are incredibly important in a wide variety of subjects and fields. Uh, this was recognized particularly in North America, where there are lots of important insect pests. So basically, your corn and pretty well everything else that you grow is ravaged by moths. And so for the last 150 years or so, there have been strong agricultural entomology programs all across uh, the US. And one of the big things they've worked on is pheromones. So I'm talking today not about moths, um, but about humans. Let's see if this will... So in outline, I'm going to take us through what is a pheromone. I'm going to briefly touch on what are not pheromones, because this has actually caused quite a bit of controversy particularly in the area of human pheromones. And then there's the thorny question as to whether we would expect humans in any event to have pheromones. And the major part of the talk is going to be about putative human pheromones. And I don't know how many of you have Googled pheromone uh, before coming here, but you will come up with a lot of hits trying to sell you things, and most of those are about putative human pheromones uh, that will make you irresistible. And I'm going to argue that we really ought to start again, that this whole 25 years of scientific activity has taken us nowhere. But I want to end with a slightly optimistic note, which is there might be one pheromone which shows a bit of promise. So that's something to look forward to at the end. So what's a pheromone? Well, in any animal, so this is not just humans, it's a universal definition, it's a chemical signal between members of the same species. Now, the signal can be eavesdropped and it can be counterfeited, but the pheromone is the communication within the species. It's the same in all members of a type. So all the males of a species produce the same molecule, but there may be different amounts. And that could be important in mate choice. So the females might go for the male with the most, um, but they all produce basically the same molecule. And something we've learnt pretty rapidly since the first identification of a pheromone is that it's usually a combination of molecules. It's not a single molecule. And what a lot of us have in mind, and this is true of the scientists as well as the non-scientists, is those of you who are familiar with the Lynx or AXA advert, and there are people running across the landscape along the seashore with their arms outstretched, um, or in a lift even, searching for the person wearing the product, which has made them irresistible. Um, it can be something that's not long range like that. It might be something that's very short range. So in mouse courtship, when the male is nuzzling the female, he transfers a high molecular weight protein uh, from his tear ducts over to the nose of the female. So it can be very short range indeed, almost a contact pheromone. But what's generally true right the way across the animal kingdom 
is that these molecules are detected by the sense of smell. Now, there are a couple that are detected by taste, which goes to a different part of the brain from smell, and that's true in insects and in mammals. But those are very small in number, and it's partly to do with the subtlety of the way that olfaction works, and we can talk about that at the end if you like. So the first identification was 55 years ago this year. It was the silk moth, uh, Bombyx mori, and Adolf Budenant, uh, as you possibly know, already had a Nobel Prize for his work on human hormones. And he then spent 20 years trying to identify the moth pheromone. And there's a reason it took him so long. But in so doing, he created the gold standard uh, for how you would go about studying a pheromone now. So what you have to start with, and this is true whatever the pheromone, you have to have something you can measure. So this is the bioassay. And in the case of the silk moth, the male flutters its wings in a very characteristic way, gets very excited, when he detects the molecules coming from the female. The reason it was a very wise choice to take the domesticated silk moth was because with the chemistry of his time, he needed half a million female moths to be able at the end of it to extract 12 milligrams of his final product. So you needed a lot of them, and by the end of the project, he was importing them from Japan, as well as all over around Germany. You, get through, you then go through the steps of identifying the molecule, synthesizing what you think the molecule is, to be sure that you really have identified it. And then finally, step five is squaring the circle, completing the circle, so that we can confirm that the molecule that you synthesize, that you think is the molecule involved, really does generate that activity in the female. And I've suggested that these are analogous to Cox postulates for identifying an infectious agent. You have to have all of these uh, before you can say you have a pheromone. And it's precisely this that hasn't been done with humans. So, how do pheromones evolve? Well, they evolve basically from any smell that gives information. And this lead us, leads us to the question of what's the difference between a cue and a signal. And mosquitoes are a good way of looking at this. So, if we give off smells um, simply by being, then uh, those smells attract mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes are using the smells that we give off as cues. We haven't evolved to give these smells off to attract mosquitoes. And of course, we'd rather they didn't use these to find us, but they do. But within a species, something that starts as a cue can evolve into a signal. And this is a scenario that we can kind of trace with goldfish. So. By accident, it was discovered some 30 years ago that many of the goldfish female pheromones are actually related to hormones that appear in her blood as she's developing the eggs before she releases them. So how did those hormones become pheromones? And you'll probably be ahead of me. Basically, um, animals are leaky. So across her gills and into her urine, the hormones are passing and any males, any mutant males that are particularly sensitive to these Q molecules that are just leaking out will get to the female first and they will lay the egg, sorry, they will lay, she will lay the eggs, he will fertilize them, but the next generation is going to be mostly composed of the fastest males that detected the female first. So you'll get selection in the males for greater and greater smell sensitivity, but also for greater and greater specificity. So he starts with a general sense of smell, but those receptor molecules become more and more specialized, so you reduce the false alarms. So now those receptors will only respond to the particular molecules that are important. And of course, there is also a selective advantage to the female of attracting a male, because otherwise her eggs are useless. If they're not fertilized, she might as well not lay them. So now she starts to produce the pheromone, 
to attract the males. And so now we have an evolved signaller and evolved receiver, and that's the definition of a signal. So in recap, if you're identifying a pheromone, you have to show that the synthetic molecules you're producing elicit the same response as the natural stimulus. That all the molecules are necessary and sufficient. There aren't some stray ones that just happen to be around that aren't really needed. And you also have to demonstrate that other molecules that are around in the environment that the male would encounter are not uh, the pheromone. And crucially, it has to be at realistic concentrations. Some of the work on human pheromones has been done at concentrations a million times the amount in an armpit. But the scientists, in this case in Sweden, at a big name institution, have been running incredibly sophisticated PET and fMRI scans, but the stimulus is a million times you get in an armpit. So biologically, this is meaningless. And then finally, you have to have a credible path for the evolution. So it needs to fit in with the biology of the animal, and you need to be able to make a reasonable story. OK, what are not pheromones? Well, as you'll know, smells are important to humans, like every other animal. And not every smell is a pheromone. And pheromone parties, which you may have seen in the newspapers, and if you Google this, you may even have been to one. Um, basically, what you do is, over a glass of wine, you take off the T-shirt that you've been wearing for the previous three days, or perhaps overnight, and you put it into a numbered bag like the one that she's holding up. And these are color-coded uh, red and blue. And you go for the gender of your choice. You open the bag, and you sniff it, and you decide whether you like the smell or not. Now, this is based originally on work with mice, uh, done many years ago. And then uh, some Swiss students were persuaded to wear the T-shirts and sniff each other. And this became a very famous paper by somebody called Wedekind, or Wedekind in which it appears that uh, women chose men who were immunologically different from themselves. So basically, they did lots of sniffing of T-shirts and then tissue typed everybody as if they were going to swap kidneys. And it looks as though in that experiment, uh, done by Wedekind in 1995, as if the women were choosing men who would be very poor kidney donors. They're immunologically different. And there was a twist. If they were on the pill, they chose men who were immunologically similar. The only problem with this whole story is that although it works on television when Robert Winston did it, it doesn't always work in practice, in replications. Now, that idea has been transferred to these pheromone parties. And what I'd argue is they're actually misnamed. Because the thing about a pheromone, and the reason you can actually identify a molecule from lots of different individuals, and it's the same molecule, is precisely because it is the same molecule. Whereas what's happening here is looking for individual differences between people. And so these are definitely not pheromones. They are to do with smell, but they're not pheromones. But if you're marketing something, pheromones sell. OK. so. Why would we expect humans to have pheromones? And the biggest reason is simply because we're mammals. And as you go across uh, different mammal species, and anybody who has a dog uh, will know that they smell. And in fact, anybody who has lived with a human, even yourself, um, will know that we actually get pretty smelly. So the biggest thing, though, is the change at puberty. And if we were any other kind of mammal, we would be looking for pheromones. Because this is just the kind of thing that Darwin commented on in The Descent of Man and Sexual Selection, or Sexual Selection and the Descent of Man, in his 1871 book. And what he describes in that book is wonderful examples of mature animals he talks about pythons, goats, elephants, all sorts of animals that, in the breeding season, sexually mature males in particular, start to get smelly. 
And of course, it was going to be 100 and almost 100 years before the molecules could be identified. But basically, he had in mind that there was sexual selection for the smelliest males, and that's what females were using to choose their mates. And it's the same kind of thing that seems to be happening in humans, at least from the point of view of the smells developing at puberty. So with any other mammal, we'd be looking for pheromones. And although there is some dispute about this, um, I'm fairly convinced that mammals do have pheromones. And there are all sorts of kinds of molecules. Um, there are lots of small ones, uh, the pig one, the rabbit one. Um, but there are also some quite large peptides. Um, ESP1 is the one that's transferred from the male's tear ducts uh, in his tears to the female's nose. And Darcin is another fascinating story uh, in the urine-released pheromone produced by males also. The other thing to remember is that our sense of smell is actually really quite good. Now, we're a long way from the ground, and it is true that our sensitivity is very much less than a dog's. So in terms of picking up the tiniest traces of smell, we're not actually that good. But in terms of the breadth of molecule that we can detect, we're actually probably as good as a mouse, probably as good as a dog. It's just that our noses have to be either closer to the source well, there has to be more of it. But that needn't be a handicap to having a pheromone. OK, so what's wrong with all these putative human pheromones? And whenever I see putative, I think it's a weasel word. That they're trying to give a let-out clause because even they don't think that they're pheromones. Or if they do, they're not confident in saying they are. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason, of course, is there's no evidence. There's none of the evidence of the kind that I was explaining with the salt moth, which basically underlies any other claim of pheromones in other species, for this work on humans. Now, there have been two waves of putative human pheromones in recent history. And the first of these uh, were based on a simple coincidence. So basically, these molecules were found in pigs and human armpits, and that was enough. The second wave is in some ways even stranger. It's based on a conference paper with no methods section, which gave no evidence for the molecules. Yet a huge edifice has been built on this of about 150 publications and 25 years of study. And the references at the bottom are people who've tried to expose this but without success. The papers keep coming about seven a year based on these second wave of molecules. So the first wave. So this is uh, two steroid molecules, androsthenone and androsthenol. And the molecules look a bit like testosterone. So they look a bit like hormones. So the idea was that, OK, these could be human pheromones. But there was no bioassay evidence that these were at all. But I think the crucial thing was, for people without a collaboration with a chemist, and knowing how complicated the secretions from mammals are, in this case, you could buy it in a can. So if you didn't have a lab, but you wanted to do some experiments, you could buy this, uh, because it's used by pig farmers to work out uh, when you uh, should artificially inseminate the sow. OK, so because there was no evidence, they created a kind of argument um, that was circumstantial. Uh, and they built up an argument that these molecules were special. So the first was that there were specific anosmias, which means that some people can't smell these. Now, if anything, that's an argument that these shouldn't be treated as pheromones. Because if a large proportion of the population can't smell these, or, as it turned out, smell them as different kinds of smells, then that probably means it's not something that's consistent across the population. There's a weird effect that if you can't smell it, and then you sniff it a lot, over a period of weeks or months, 
you increase your sensitivity. So after that period, you can smell it better. And then apparently there were differences between the sexes in how much they produced in their armpits and how well they perceived this. And there was even a suggestion that at different stages of the menstrual cycle, women were able to smell it better than at others. All of these things turned out in closer analysis to be false. And actually lots of the things turn out, to, if they're true at all, to be equally true of isovaleric acid, um, the smell that gives um, the characteristic smell of cheddar, but also uh, feet. So it's nothing necessarily terribly sexy. So it turned out this was basically a circumstantial argument to try to justify their specialness, when in fact there was no evidence. OK, so the second wave uh, came from this Paris conference in 1991 that was sponsored by the Erox Corporation, which coincidentally was patenting human pheromones as fragrances or as additions to fragrances. And it was at that conference that Monty Block and Grosser published this paper. And this is where putative, I think, may even be the first use. It's the effect of putative pheromones on the electrical activity of the human vermeuronasal organ and olfactory epithelium. Now, put to one side that nobody else has found a vermeuronasal organ in humans that works, that's actually functional in adults. But put that to one side. This is the methods so far as the chemical stimuli are concerned. It's an asterisk and the comment that these putative pheromones were supplied by the Erox Corporation. And that's as far as it goes. There is no account of how the molecules were collected, isolated, identified, bioassayed, synthesized, and confirmatory bioassayed. None of that exists. And when the patent was published a little while later, there were no details in that either. So it's quite remarkable that these two steroid molecules were proposed uh, without any evidence at all. Uh, one of them, the top, and, was apparently produced uh, by males and affected females, and est was produced by females and affected males. The weird thing about est is that previously it had only been recorded in the urine of pregnant women in the third trimester. So there were no records of it being given off generally and no reason to suppose that it might be a signal. So simply, all we know is that the molecules were supplied by the corporation which was sponsoring the conference. And the later patents don't give any more details. Now, nothing might have happened. It was a conference, it was published in a small journal, but something did happen that changed the course of the science, which was a paper appeared in 2000 in a respectable journal. But what was more important is that the second author was very well known, had a very good reputation as a scientist, and came from a very well-known university, the University of Chicago. And they used these two molecules. Why did they use the two molecules? Simply because they'd been presented at this conference <coughs> and had been patented. So that was the source of the information. But because a respectable scientist in a reasonable journal, hailing from a good laboratory, published this paper, an enormous number of people started treating the molecules as respectable. And since then, we have about...
were very easy to purchase. And so if you didn't have a lab that could do the very complicated analysis you need to do to identify pheromones, especially from animals as smelly as mammals, you could still do the work. And you didn't need the collaboration with a good chemist, which otherwise you need to do. <coughs> there was also a crowd mentality, because there was a growing literature that assumed these were putative human pheromones. So there was a self-referential literature, and nobody was going back to the source to see how flimsy the basis. So this is the idea that women living in close proximity 
have their menstrual cycles start to synchronize. And anecdotally, uh, many women have reported this. But there are a number of problems with the whole phenomenon, partly because how do you define synchrony? At what level of overlap do you say that something is synchronized? But also, there's a great deal of variability between women and between months, as I understand. And so the statistics are awful and difficult. And it looks as though, although uh, this study, Stern and Clinton, suggested that there was something from the underarms of women at one stage of their cycle, which would speed up or slow down <coughs> the cycle of other women, which would give a mechanism for the phenomenon. This was hotly contested. And since then, the idea of menstrual synchrony itself has been contested. Uh, both in rats, which is the original model, but also in humans. And some 15 years later, after the 98 study, there are still no molecules proposed, and which for something that is so important and so exciting and interesting, if anything had been found, I have no doubt that we would have heard about it. It would have been another nature paper. <coughs> okay, so how should we go forward? Well, I think we need a new start uh, to actually do this properly. And these are the questions we need to answer. So the first thing is, which area should we look at? And the answer, surprisingly, comes from the swimming pools in Reykjavik, in Iceland. And it's all about armpits. And we're obsessed with it. And it's not without foundation, because it is true that these are the scent plants that are characteristic of the great apes. So there's a good reason for thinking about those. But those are not the only places that produce smells. The obvious smells themselves um, come from these odorless precursors. And there are bacteria in the armpits, mostly living on the hair, which break down these odorless precursors into the smells that we know. And one of the best ways of um, removing the smell from your armpits um, is the very simple one, clear felling your armpits. So taking out the rainforest, and basically you remove the habitat for the bacteria to live on. The other things you do with uh, deodorants and um, the antiperspirants are basically shutting down the sweat gland, so there's less moisture, and so the bacteria need the moisture along with the precursors to do their work. So along the top, uh, you've got the green molecules, which are the precursors, which are largely odorless. And then the bacteria get to work, and then these produce the smells that we know. But there is a twist which is that about 20% of the world's population don't secrete these molecules. And the way that you can tell is if you have white earwax. Now the connection is a coincidence, probably. But if you have white earwax, it's because you are a double A homozygous for this gene ABCC11. And it's a membrane pulp. And it pulps water into the wax in your ear but in your armpit, where it's also expressed, it pulps out along with the water the precursors that the bacteria use as their food to break down into the smells. So it was first noticed um, as a gene behind earwax, and then uh, it was noticed that it was associated with heavy sweating. And then finally, um, Martin et al. discovered that it was the uh, gene behind the pumping or not pumping smells of armpits. Now, 97% of people from Northeast Asia, China, Korea, Japan, are homozygous uh, BA. And so they have white earwax and armpits that don't smell as bad as mine. 3% of people in Bristol are triple A, sorry, double A. And they produce very little smell. But you may have read the study, I think it was last year or the year before, where it turned out for cultural reasons, if you have white earwax in Bristol, uh, you still use a deodorant because um, as a Caucasian 
without, without bits that don't smoke, um, you still use the geo even though you have no need of them. So, what this tells me is that perhaps we're looking in the wrong place, that armpits are smelly, but they're simply the least embarrassing place to ask for a sample. And what we ought to do is go deeper. So, if you go into a Scandinavian swimming pool, they don't trust the visitors to know what to do. And so there are these signs um, in five different languages saying every guest is required to wash thoroughly without a swimsuit before entering the pool. And hopefully they marked the areas that are smelling and the uh, solution, which is of course the shampoo. So they marked out the areas that we could be looking for these potential pheromones. These are also areas that have the glands, I guess probably a sight and feet, the glands that start to secrete at puberty. So you're familiar with chromatography. Uh, this is um, liquid uh, paper chromatography, a black ink that's a mixture of different pigments, is separated by the water going into paper into the different colours. But what really revolutionised pheromone research was the invention of gas liquid chromatography which was its own Nobel Prize. And you'll be familiar with the way that you can take a mixture of molecules and put them at one end of the gas chromatograph. They're blown by the gas through the column, anything up to 30 meters long, and they arrive at the detector, flame or infrared, and by the time it reaches the detector, molecules have been separated out in time. And so you can now then feed those to your last spec and identify them. And that means that nowadays, you could, if you had a rough idea of what the molecules were, do what took half a million moths in Britain that day uh, with a single moth today. Now, this is a typical mammal. It's a human armpit, like the one you saw earlier. And basically, the take home message is that each of, the, each of those peaks is one or more molecules. So there are at least 700 compounds, probably more, and this makes it a nightmare for identification, but more importantly, which are the molecules that might be pheromones? Where do you start? Okay, well, one of the best ways of approaching this is to compare chemical profiles of contrasted types of individual. So classically, if you're looking for pheromones produced by males, you'd look at the difference between male and female profiles. But you could also, since most of these molecules in mammals are under the control of hormones, the androgens, you can look at castrated males versus intact males. And molecules that are dependent on androgen for their production will be absent in the castrated males. So, as an example, uh, a paper that came out in March this year basically looked at the smells that goats produce, that male goats produce, that basically are attracted to female goats, but as importantly, switch the goat female from not cycling, not producing eggs, into cycling, into the estrus cycle. So during the uh, large part of the year when they're not reproducing, she stops the cycling. So she's in an estrus. The smell of the male goat switches her into estrus. And the way they studied this was to put a shower cap on top of the head of a male and with a little molecular trap called tenaps collected the smells that were coming up into the shower cap. They ran them through the GC and this is what it looked like. So, in previous studies, they've shown that although there were lots of smells, and some of the peaks representing a very large amount of it, uh, covered a wide range of molecules, this purple area was the area that was of interest to the females, that actually stimulated the switch to uh, estrus. And what they did then was compare intact males, the top trace, with castrated males, bottom trace. 
And to give you one example, uh, if we blow that peak up, basically the intact male produces a lot of this molecule, and the castrated individual produces almost nothing. So this makes it a candidate molecule to test on the female, but actually with quite a lot of peaks that appear in intact male, but not castrated. So all of them had to be tested. And they concluded that one of these molecules was the one that actually had the effect. But probably, as I was saying earlier, it was a combination of molecules that actually had the full effect. So, with humans, well, we could compare adult males and females, but we could also compare adult males and females with children before they reach the age of puberty. And what we could look at is what changes when that hormonal switch occurs as you go through puberty and become a smelly adult. And again, what we're doing is looking for the peaks that differ. So what we need to do is go back to the Budenstein gold standard to work out which molecules really are pheromones. And I think actually the biggest problem is going to be identifying the bioassays. Because in the case of the silk moth, you have the male fluttering its wings. In the case of the goat, you have the female switching back to estrus. And I have no idea what we're going to find as the bioassay for looking at humans. And I think I may come back to that later. Now there is something that we could do, which might be a shortcut, but we're actually too early. And as you may know, we have about 400 different olfactory receptor uh, proteins in our nose. And each of us has a slightly different set of the 400. Different variants, some work, some don't work. And what this means, in the same way as some of us have a color deficiency and see the world differently, we may not see red, we may not see green. When each of us in the room is eating the same meal, in fact, we're having a different smell and sensation, which is what colloquially we call taste. Now, that's true for general smells. What we might expect for pheromones is there'll be strong stabilizing selection for lack of variety. In other words, if it's a receptor for a pheromone, we might expect that everybody would have it, because the cost of losing it and having a non-functional copy would mean it wouldn't be produced. So, receptors for pheromones should vary less. And if you could find the receptors that vary less, you could then look for the molecules that they bind. In the technical jargon, you deorphanize those receptors, and that might give you candidate pheromones. But at the moment, we only have a very small number of these receptors matched to their ligand, to the odor that stimulates them. And so, we wouldn't be able to do this at the moment. Okay, the challenges. Well, as I mentioned, it's good at bioassays that are the real problem. Because we simply don't understand enough about sex in humans, if indeed it is going to be sex that we study. And the other problem is the amount of money that's available for working on smell in general. And an indication of this is given by the value that society in general gives to the sense of smell. And one indication that I've come across recently is if you look at the societies in the UK that were formed to help the people who've lost one of the senses, they're in this order. The Society for Helping People Who Are Blind was set up in 1868. The Society for Helping People Who Are Deaf was set up in 1911. The Society for Helping People Who Lost Their Sense of Smell, it's called Fifth Sense, was only 2012. So there's a huge difference in the way the society has treated the loss of our sense of smell. And that is despite the fact that it actually is devastating if you do lose it. Okay, so to end, um, what might be the first human pheromone? And I'd like to suggest that it might be the mammary pheromone. So, human babies learn their mother's smell, and every mother is different. Um, 
They also learn how to bond smells too. Uh, and parents learn the smells of their babies. So it's something that humans might have evolved a very good at. But there's a French group that's been looking at something that seems to be the same in every model. And this might be a mammary pheromone. It's not been identified yet, but it does seem to be the same in every human model. So this is a picture uh, from Benoit Charles Lab in Dijon in France. Uh, this is the head of the baby. This is the areola gland. And a lactating mother also secretes from the bulbs, which are the areola glands, around the nipple. And it's this secretion which seems to be the same in every mother. So this is the bioassay. So this is the sleeping baby, and this is a clean glass rock, and the baby remains sleeping. But if we put some of that secretion from any mother on the glass rod, then the baby opens its mouth and starts to root, starts to search for the nipple. And since it's the same in every mother, that would fit the definition of pheromone. Now, why is this of interest? Well, there's a correlation between the number of glands around a mother's nipple and the ease of suckling starting. And it's a very distressing thing for many new mothers when the baby doesn't start to take its first milk meal. And if we could synthesize the molecules that are produced by mothers uh, that are producing the, the secretion, and we could have a, a lipstick that we could put around the nipple, then we might be able to make every baby a good suckler from the start. So it might eliminate this problem of poor suckling. And this is vitally important because getting your first meals is a vital thing for any mammal. And of course, if you miss all those meals, you also miss the colostrum and all the immunological benefits that come from it. <coughs> so in summary, um, I've argued that these putative human pheromones are simply without evidence and that it's misguided to continue studying these. And really, we need to put them to one side because they're not telling us anything real about humans. And what we need to do instead is start again. We need to have proper bioassay guided identification. And one suggestion I'm making is that we ought to go out and compare pre and post pubescent smells as the starting point. And it may turn out that the first pheromone that we identify actually has nothing to do with sex, at least the early stages, but only its outcome, the mammary pheromone. Um, there's a shortened version of this talk um, on TED, and uh, the book, if you're logged on within Oxford, you should be able to read it, but some parts of it are on the way already. So, thank you very much. Of mammary pheromone have an analogue or even something identical in other mammals, if um, humans have it? Um, the answer is yes. Um, so this same team who worked on the mammary pheromone uh, previously worked on rabbits and identified the rabbit mammary pheromone. Um, and Benoit is married to a midwife, which uh, is a good access, I think, um, with ethics um, <laughs> um, to their use of models. So the answer is that, yes, there is an um, uh, analogy with other um, species uh, now. Um, but one of the things we've learned um, is that uh, animals, and this goes right across the animal kingdom, whatever molecule works can become a pheromone. And one of the fascinating things is um, that other animals do it differently. In fact, mice don't have a pheromone. Uh, for suckling, and instead there, uh, the baby mice learn the smell of their mother and use that as the place to search, uh, and they learn very quickly. And so every uh, mouse litter 
is responding to a different molecule. Whereas in rabbits, it's always the same one. So the answer is yes, there are good precedents in human species. Which gives one hope. Um, you briefly mentioned mosquitoes at the beginning. I thought they targeted using carbon dioxide. Are you suggesting there's more to it than that? Um, they do use carbon dioxide. Um, but there's a, a group, uh, in fact, there's a nice um, talk on TEDx about the attraction of mosquitoes to humans. They use carbon dioxide, heat, and some molecules that get held by humans. And they use all three. And that's quite common in blood sucking insects because you get a better fix on your target if you use multiple uh, sen uh, sensory um, inputs. And if one's working, um, you use that. If that's not working, you use the other. And they may also kick in at different distances um, from the target. But yes, carbon dioxide is one of the major ones. In recent decades, we've realised how much we and other animals are influenced by our parasites and our microbiome. Is there any possibility that it's manipulation? Our microbiome obviously doesn't have sensors except for detecting chemicals, it's got no eyesight. Is it possible that it's our parasites, our microbiome, that are influencing us in made choice? Uh, the answer is almost certainly yes. Um, but not through pheromones. Um, not so, as much, obviously. Yeah. So, in terms of the individual smells we produce, um, it's a very complex mixture of all the things that um, change day to day in terms of diet and our health and our physiology, our hormone cycles. And things. Um, our genetics influence the bacteria that grow on us, possibly indirectly through our immune system but also through the molecules that we produce. Um, so one big example I've mentioned is um, whether you're uh, double A for the A, B, C, D, like just a one for a, a gene. So you'll have slightly different microbes depending on which gene version you have of that. Um, and it's probably some of those smells that are um, producing our individual smell. Um, and dissecting those out is going to be very complex. And one of the fascinating things is that now that you can um, DNA fingerprint the bacteria on different parts of the body and different individuals, you can now discover a huge microbiome that previously was invisible. Because until you could um, look at the DNA of the bacteria that were collected and instead have to grow the bacteria on plates, what we were selecting for were the bacteria we were growing. And so suddenly, now that you can take all the DNA of all the bacteria, we're discovering there's a huge variation between people and between different parts of the body of people. And there are some lovely um, figures in the literature where no one's the same. Um, now, bacteria could, if they were the same, um, be producing some of the pheromones. Um, there are some precedents in that with locusts. That some of the locust molecules that appear to have pheromone activity are actually produced by gut bacteria. And it seems to be the same in all locusts. Um, so it's not impossible that you can evolve to respond to a molecule that is consistent, um, even if it's produced by something else. Um, because the whole area of, of our microbiome is too gross to think about, but actually is ever more fascinating. Um, so, as you've been talking, pheromones seem to basically be involved in sort of sexual selection in animals. So, maybe I've got the wrong end of it. <laughs> but, no, um, what you've got the right end is I didn't talk about all the other ones. Okay. Um, so, I'm just thinking possibly in humans it's so difficult to find because you know, we have other things to do sexual selection with our intelligence and culture and things, not just you, know, you smell nice and look good. So, do you think possibly it's difficult to isolate the things because they've just genetically drifted away because they don't confer an advantage anymore? I think that's certainly possible, and I'm sure that's going to be a complication. Um, in terms of pheromones across the animal kingdom, they're used for almost anything you can think of. So, particularly in social insects, 
um, the whole activity in a termite nest or a bee's nest um, is driven by smells of different kinds. So different kinds of pheromones affecting long-term effects uh, of whether you develop into a worker or a queen, um, whether you forage uh, today or tomorrow, all sorts of things are driven by an orchestration of pheromones. You're right, it could be uh, that we simply, um, I guess a bit like the appendix, we only have a vestigial pheromone that actually, or pheromones, that actually you don't really use. And certainly that is one of the complications, so I haven't mentioned is culture. And there is no group of humans on the planet that doesn't have culture. Um, and how you separate out um, the learned behaviours, um, learned associations with smells, and all these other things, plus all the other reasons for finding people attractive or not, um, whether it's how rich they are, how pretty they are, whether they make you laugh, all these things. Um, it's going to be really hard. So in some ways, I'm actually not that optimistic on the sex program side. And I think what would be what would be amazing is if some non-sexual pheromones in areas of biology that are important have pheromones identified, like the mammary pheromone, um, then potentially it would give us hope that it might be looking at some lungs. But it might turn out that we never find it. And that would be fine. But at the moment, what I want to move us away from is searching on these four molecules that have no basis in the Ben, you say that pheromones work in quite short distances. Or, or can. Or can. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering how that kind of relates to um, animals, for example, that use smells and animations such as nocturnal seabirds that will find their nests using the sense of smell, and whether pheromones could have a role in that or is it just in different instances? Look, navigation using smell it's a wonderful topic, and it's turned out to be incredibly complicated. So, the original idea was that um, the male moth flying to the female moth, giving off the pheromone, was flying at a gradient. And it turns out that over the distances that the male moths could respond, which may be hundreds of meters, um, if it was a gradient, um, it would be too faint to discover. So it's emerged gradually, and the same thing works for um, uh, albatross and petrels. Uh, when the air, or, and it works on water as well, when the fluid, the air, blows across the female, it picks up pockets of air that contain lots of the molecule. And the rate of diffusion from the, the um, package of air is is actually very slow compared with the bulk of flow being blown downwind. And so what that means is it's almost as if it's bubbles of smell blowing downwind. And the way that animals respond, well certainly in moths, where it's been looked at in some detail, is that when a male who's just sort of flying almost rapidly hits one of these pockets, he flies upwind for a few thousandths of a second. And if he hasn't hit another pocket of air, another bubble, he starts to fly from side to side, and then he'll probably hit another pocket of air with the furrow, and he'll fly away. And what that gives you is a zigzag towards the source that copes with a very intermittent signal. So it's actually driven by the way that turbulent flow occurs naturally. And the same thing probably is happening to the albatross. Because you, if you look at the scale of kilometers, you can see albatross um, zigzagging. So they have little GPS collars. And you can see them going across wind until they hit the odor flute. And then they start to zigzag. And they look just like a moth. Now, probably the mechanism in the brain is going to be different. But it looks as though they're doing something similar. Flying up wind, when they had odour. And if they come out of the flu, flying back in again. Um, so you've um, hit on a, a very important problem, which also is the source of algorithms for designing robots to find gas leaks on the water and all sorts of things. So you can use that same kind of turn right, turn left, go ahead, um, when you've hit a, a consecrated 
the moment to guide that kind of medication to. Um, how does that work underwater? Because underwater you've often got no current, or else everything's moving with the current, as it were. Um, there are two situations. If there's no current, um, then you are going to have a problem. But it's actually at the scale of um, centimetres and metres, it's very rare to have no current at all. There'll be eddies and there'll be still flows. Uh, are you talking about wet. sea or fresh water or? In, in almost anything, even in a lake, there's actually quite a lot of water movement. Um, some of the things depend on scope. So if you're tiny, if you're the level of millimetres, then um, you're basically swimming through treacle. You're at very low ground levels. And so there, um, everything changes, and you may actually be able to go up gradient. And indeed, if an animal swims through, the trail will be like a vapor trail of a plane, and it will last for minutes. Um, and animals can actually even track the direction of the blue. Whereas in more turbulent situations, you simply can't do that. Um, but otherwise, so long as you scale for the density of the, um, the fluid, whether you're talking about air or water, um, everything scales. So there have been some lovely studies of moth and tape done in water with large antennae. And you can study all sorts of things to do with the flow of the, um, the water or the fluid, whichever, through the, um, the antenna. And you can uh, use that as a model. So basically, uh, any fluid behaves the same. And it's the same equation.